the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Prometheus, a 2012 prequel to the original Alien quadrilogy. Prometheus was made by Ridley Scott, who directed the first Alien film back in 1979. And you'd think with his return to the series, this movie would be a slam dunk. Unfortunately, I found it pretty mediocre and frustrating. And at times it even felt like I was just watching that first movie all over again, only without any xenomorphs. That's because Ridley Scott and co-writer Damon Lindelof, showrunner of Lost, didn't want Prometheus to set up any specific storyline from the old movies, and instead were more interested in only visually referencing those films. So for Prometheus' aliens, they wanted all new creations, although sometimes they end up feeling like B-grade xenomorphs. And why make new shit if it's all just crappier versions of old shit? Looking at you, most remakes. So although this movie's got a hell of a cast, from the OG Lizbeth Salander to everyone's ideal James Bond, and it looks absolutely beautiful, from all the sweeping landscape shots to the way it perfectly combines practical effects and CG, I just couldn't fall in love with Prometheus. I think the best thing I can say about it is that it's very ambitious. It really wants to engage with lofty, even biblical questions like where did we all come from and what does it all mean? Too bad the movie ultimately forgets to be entertaining and mostly leaves you yelling at the characters for making stupid choices. Thankfully, we all know that stupid choices often lead to people dying. Let's find out how many victims there are and get to the kill. The movie begins with gorgeous shots of an ancient Earth's landscape, played by northeastern parts of present-day Iceland. Great acting there, Iceland. An alien figure walks towards a spaceship, hovering over the real-life Dedefoss waterfall, and takes off his robe to- Oh my god, that is the most ripped being I've ever seen. Yo, this dude gives Mr. Universe a new meaning. Watch your traps, Arnold. As his transport leaves, this engineer consumes a weird-looking substance that breaks him down at a molecular level, causing a horrific disintegration that looks pretty damn cool. And fun fact, the VFX house that did this effect, Weka, also created the snap in Infinity War. You know what? That makes sense. Oh, and by the way, I'm not putting engineers on the kill count. Yes, I know they're as humanoid as they come, but if I make it a precedent to include them, I'll be screwed when I get to Covenant. Anyway, with this dude's genes going every which way, these aliens just said, let there be title card, or er, life, let there be life. We jump to 2093, where a science vessel named Prometheus is cruising and through space. And just as a refresher, the original Alien took place more than a hundred years after this, in 2122. Walking around the Prometheus is David, a very obvious android character played by potentially real-life android Michael Fassbender. He just looks so perfect. How can he be real? David's the only one awake right now and spends his time doing trick shots, learning human languages, and soaking up human culture. But don't let his Lawrence of Arabia-inspired aesthetic fool you. David knows how advanced he is and is pretty damn resentful of all the lowly meat bags he has to watch over. After nearly two and a half years of traveling time, the Prometheus is finally approaching its destination, spelling an end to David's solitude. The first human to awaken, all on her own, is Meredith Vickers, a Wayland company woman played by bona fide action superstar Charlize Theron. David gets everyone else up out of their sleep pods, and all of a sudden, we've got a ship full of characters to meet. Hey look, it's that douche from Fallen Kingdom, trying to make friends with that whispery villain from Mission Impossible. And right over there is Liza Aaron. Most exciting for me, though, is Idris Elba playing the ship's captain, Yannick. That dude is the coolest motherfucker alive, man. Vickers holds a meeting to brief the Prometheus's crew, and part of her presentation involves a holographic tape made by the recently deceased Peter Wayland, who this movie says is the founder of Wayland Corps. So I guess we're just retconning away Charles Bishop Wayland from Alien vs. Predator. But hopefully, the Scarlex relationship is still canon. Peter Wayland is played by Guy Pierce in disgusting lizard man looking makeup, and he introduces the rest of the crew to doctors Elizabeth Shaw and Charlie Holloway, a pair of archaeologists who are also in love. Shaw is played by Numi Rapace of the Swedish Girl with a Dragon Tattoo series, while Holloway is played by Logan Marshall Green, who would go on to be in more horror films like The Invitation and Lee Winnell's Upgrade. Holloway says that ancient artifacts collected from throughout the ages all point to the same constellation of stars that's too far from Earth for any of these early civilizations to have known about. Unless... Aliens. The constellation's got a planet, the planet's got a moon, bing bang boom, that's where the Prometheus has just arrived. At the satellite, known as LV-223, Fifield, that shameless looking geologist back there, asks Shaw what she thinks they'll find. We call them engineers. Do you mind uh, telling us what they engineered? They engineered us. 
Although the holographic lizard man had said Shaw and Holloway were in charge of this mission, Vickers brings them to her penthouse looking room, which is actually a separate module of the ship, complete with a tanning bed looking med pod thing, to tell them not to be mistaken. She's the boss bitch around here. Uh, yeah, no kidding. Look at that power space pantsuit. Prometheus descends towards the satellite and enters its atmosphere, which is noted to be very high in CO2 and lethal for humans to breathe. So yeah, this place is dangerous, but it also looks damn pretty as they fly through its sky. Say what you will about these characters or this storyline, Ridley Scott knows how to shoot a film. I especially love this valley they fly into, which is made from an actual desert valley in Jordan combined with a background shot of some mountains in Iceland. Awesome. In this valley, the Prometheus crew spies an alien structure, so Yannick sets the ship down nearby and everyone takes in the view. Yeah, that's worthy of a head smooch for show. A ground team suits up to look like Terran Marines, and David joins them in the outfitting, even though he'd be fine without a spacesuit. He explains that he does it, so he won't make any of the meat bags uncomfortable. Making you guys pretty close, huh? Not too close, I hope. Damn, David's got some people problems. They head out in a Land Rover and a couple of ATVs, and eventually enter the Hollow Alien Temple, as others, such as Yannick and Vickers, watch on monitors from back aboard the Prometheus. Inside, it's looking pretty OG alien in there, Mr. Scott, but at least we get these cool X-bomb looking drones that set out to map the alien cave system around them and transmit the 3D map back to the Prometheus. I don't care who you are, that's cool technology. They get to a rainy shaft, where they see that the the CO2 levels are so low, they don't even need those fish bowls on their heads anymore. There's something generating an atmosphere. Cleaner than Earth, actually. I mean, that's cool and all, but maybe still wear that shit in case of alien bacteria or something? Then again, I'm not a spacefaring scientist, so what the fuck do I know, right? These helmetless yahoos walk around some more before David finds some ectoplasmic goop on the wall and then somehow beep boops the right combo of bip bops to start a light show in the hallways that depicts a bunch of holographic engineers running for their lives. What the hell was that? I don't know, y'all. You tell me. Seems like some kind of security footage from the past or something? something? Because after they see one engineer get decapitated by a door, they walk up and find its body right where the light show left it 2,000 years ago. Finding hard evidence of alien existence is too much for Fifield, so he and biologist Milburn, played by Rafe Spall, leave to head back to the ship. After they leave, David once again somehow bim-bams the door open. Wait, we don't know what's on the other side. Oops, sorry. Uh, Jeez, I thought 3PO was insufferable. Behind the door, they find Olmec, he of the Hidden Temple, as well as that engineer's head and a whole bunch of vases. Although I'm a little annoyed at how this looks like that room from Alien, only with vases instead of eggs, I've got to give props to Prometheus for building so many fully sized kick-ass sets. They built them at Pinewood Studios on the famous 007 stage, the single biggest film stage in Europe, which, as its name suggests, is where they shot a bunch of James Bond movies. The team begins to explore, not noticing these little wormy guys on the ground, before an incoming storm outside causes the Prometheus crew to call them back. As the scientists bag the decapitated engineer head, David sees some black tar looking goop emerging from the bases and steals one of the urns without anyone else noticing. They reboard their land vehicles and try to outrun the storm back to the Prometheus, and despite a head mishap and the silica storm catching up to them, David's able to Batman them back aboard the spaceship where they're mostly safe and sound. There's only one problem. Turns out Fifield and Milburn never made it back, and instead got lost in the alien tunnels. How did the crew aboard the Prometheus, watching them on camera, allow them to get lost? I have no idea, but with the storm raging outside, these two are gonna have to bunker down for the night. The scientists sterilize the engineer head and discover that its cabal-looking visage is actually just a mask, and that the engineer's real head looks pretty damn human underneath. This should be a pretty big deal to alien fans. We've known these gigantic elephantine engineers since the original film, but most people just assume that that's how they looked, and not that they were wearing a helmet or anything. Now we're learning that that figure the Nostromo crew found is actually one of those super buff engineers like the dude we saw by the waterfall earlier. Shaw gets the genius idea to, what, cattle prod the brainstem? I, I think we can trick the nervous system into thinking it's still alive. Sounds like a fun time, for a sadist. But they do it anyway, and after the head wakes up and starts bleeding all over the place, it eventually explodes like a peep in a microwave. Mortal laughter. 
Oh. Yeah, David, sorry we're not all perfect androids like you. They examine the mess left over and discover that the engineer's DNA exactly matches human DNA. So, wow, I really don't have a good excuse for not including engineers on the kill count other than inconvenience. But I'm still sticking to it. David, meanwhile, opens his new vase to find, uh, I don't know, but it's slimy as heck, whatever it is. Wait, is that a crab leg? Wait, is that a crab leg lava lamp? How many Chuck E. Cheese tickets does that cost? He cracks it open and takes some of the black liquid out so he can get creepy with it. Big things have small beginnings. David finds Holloway playing pocket pool and getting drunk since he's depressed that all the engineers are apparently dead. He wanted to ask them important questions like why did they make people and why should anyone care if you put pineapple on a pizza. David pours the sad sack another drink and spikes it with that black liquid, but Holloway doesn't notice and drinks it down like a good little meat bag. He goes back to Shaw's bunk where she shows him the DNA results and they celebrate the discovery by having sex in space. Back in the alien temple, Fifield and Milburn come across those alien vases, which are now all leaking that black goo. Out of a tar pit sprouts a couple of Dianoga-looking creatures called Hammerpedes, which are the result of those worms we saw earlier getting infected by the black goo, and which were made using a combination of good CG and practical puppets on a cabling system. Milburn is a total fucking moron and approaches them like they're kitty cats, even though they look more like an ugly nutsack at the end of a veiny dick. Damn, the alien movies are phallic. One of them Sprouts frills like a Dilophosaurus and attacks Milburn, because of course it's going to, you stupid jackass. And when Fifield tries to cut it off, he gets sprayed in the face with alien acid blood. His visor melts into his skin, and he falls face first into a puddle of goo, while the Hammerpede crawls into Milburn's helmet and then right down his throat to choke him to death. The next morning, Holloway wakes up not feeling great, with eyes so red, not even clear eyes could help. And clear eyes is awesome. A bunch of the crew heads back to the temple to look for Milburn and Fifield and end up in the vase room where those urns are bubbling like the Clampet Swamp. They find Milburn's body, but no sign of Fifield. And before they can look for him further, Holloway gets so sick from David's alien juice cocktail that he can't even stand on his own anymore. David himself has been on his own side quest this whole time and finds a giant room with a quadrant of caskets and the squishiest control panel I've ever seen. Man, I want to press those buttons. Because he can apparently flu Stop any alien device ever, he successfully activates another holographic memory, showing that the engineers love to get down with the jazz flu. Hey Aqualung! It also shows David how to use this room for holographic space maps. Look at me, I'm a star! I can see why this is so much fun. He's got the whole world in his hands. The whole world in his hands. When the light show goes down, David realizes that one of those caskets contains the apparently last living engineer, and that's enough to give him a creepy android smile. The crew gets back to the Prometheus, but since Holloway is looking almost as bad as reptilian Guy Pierce, Vickers refuses to let him board because it might mean contaminating the ship. You know, the same exact dilemma Ripley had in the original goddamn alien movie we've all already seen. But Holloway is actually in so much pain, he doesn't even want to keep living. So after croaking to Shaw that he loves her baby, he tells Vickers to do it to it, Lars, and she does. That boy goes up looking like that Let It Burn Elmo gif, and he succumbs to the flames right right there on the ramp of the Prometheus as Vickers and Shaw react with shock and hysteria. Shaw wakes up in a med bay to David asking if she and Holloway had boned lately. What, they forget to program some tact into you, buddy? Cause that's pretty damn personal. But he's asking because she's pregnant and it looks like the baby's three months along even though the supposed consummation only happened last night. It's not exactly a traditional fetus. She demands that David remove the fetus but he refuses and drugs her instead cause David's no longer a tweener. He's a full on heel mother after he leaves, Shaw sneaks off on her own to Vickers' med pod and hops inside to get an emergency C-section. Emergency C-section? Before that baby ups and belly bursts her. The machine removes an egg sac with a squid-like creature inside called a trilobite, which kind of feels like Ridley Scott wanted a new chestburster that wasn't quite a chestburster for some reason. Still, the trilobite looks freaking awesome. It's another practical creature that uses a cabling system to move around, and it was designed by Neil Scanlon, who also made the hammer piece and other creature effects in this movie, and whose work was last seen on the kill count when I covered Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. I love this dude and his team's animatronic effects, and the fact that they made this alien embryo using a condom. Always use a prophylactic. Shaw slinks under the trilobite to escape, then shuts it inside the med pod and gasses it with a decontaminant that she 
she hopes will kill the creature. Spoiler, it doesn't. In the cockpit, Yannick sees that Fifield's helmet cam is suddenly right outside the ship. So forget doing anything cautious. Let's just open the pod bay doors, Hal, and see what's going on. I hope he's a zombie or something. A Kiati Mundi looking zombie. He's actually more of a Kiati mutant, and mutant Fifield kills five dudes while jumping around and screaming like a monkey. <laughs> The first dude's a nameless mechanic whose helmet is shattered with the backhand. The second dude, Wallace, gets a real brutal kill when Fifield jumps on him and bashes his helmet and face open. The third dude, Taplo, successfully lights Fifield on fire only for the now flaming mutant to jump off the top rope and crack his helmet open with a body slam. The fourth dude, Shepard, is killed by simply being thrown against a transport. And the fifth dude, Furtick, gets an axe in his back while trying to escape and then is also tossed aside. The survivors get into a rover and run over the mutant fight field like he's a xenomorph, and the nasty boy is put down for good after Yannick and his pilot Chance unload on it with a flamethrower and a shotgun. It's a pretty solid action sequence, and I respect the hell out of fight field's actor Sean Harris for actually doing all these cable stunts and getting lit on fire a bunch of times. But I hate how mutant fight field looks so much like a zombie. It's weird to have that in an alien movie. Then again, it could have been worse. One version of this sequence involved a fully CG character who just looks way way too much like an animal to me. On her way to a human centipede costume contest, Shaw stumbles into a room where it turns out that crusty old Peter Wayland is actually still alive. How fortunate for us. More of the Sawyer family grandpa. Seriously, he looks like Palpatine fucked a California raisin. It's gross. Wayland's been in hypersleep this whole time, but now that David's found a living engineer, oh yeah, Shaw, BT dubs, your gods are still alive, Wayland wants to meet one and see if it can save him. Save you from what? Death, of course. But these engineers might not be the saving type, since Yannick tells Shaw that this place isn't their home, it's a military outpost they were using to develop weapons of mass destruction like the bases full of oily black goo. Wait, WMDs and oil? Why does this all sound familiar? Still, Shaw wants to at least meet the last living engineer, you know, see if they click or whatever, so Yannick tells her go ahead, as long as that black goo stays off the ship. Wayland is affixed with fancy robot legs, and it's back to the temple we go. So exciting, these back and forth trips. On their way to the casket room, they pass through a storage area filled with thousands of those vases. And when Yannick sees this, he re-examines the holographic map of the structure and realizes that the part they're in is actually a croissant? It's a goddamn ship. Oh, a goddamn ship. Sorry, looked like a croissant to me. This wishbone-shaped ship is a juggernaut, the same type of ship the Nostromo crew found on LV-426 that held all those xenomorph eggs that led to Kane's facehugging. That means this casket room is actually a bridge, and David hops into the captain's chair to kick things off with some jazz flute. He says this ship's engineers were accidentally killed by the black goo virus right before they left to pay Earth a visit. Why? Sometimes to create. One must first destroy. Aw oh, man, our makers were trying to destroy us? It's revelations all over again. David pops open the casket like it ain't shit, and out rises the last living engineer, played by the over seven foot Ian White, who we just saw as the Predator in the AVP movies. He's the dude who also does all the Game of Thrones stuff. To play the last engineer, White had to undergo more than four hours of prosthetic application overseen by makeup artist Connor O'Sullivan. The engineer don't give a fuck about Wayland or his questions, and instead, just grabs David by the neck and makes short work tearing the android's head off. <laughs> and then he beats down Wayland with it? Awesome. Shaw runs away while the engineer adds two kills to the count. Kate Dickey's medic character named Ford and a security officer named Jackson. Both kills? Pretty lame. But at least Wayland gets a decent death. Just kidding. He says there's nothing and then dies of his injuries sustained from getting head beaten. His death witnessed back on the Prometheus by his daughter Vickers. Oh yeah, turns out she's his daughter. They revealed that a couple of scenes ago. It doesn't really matter though. Though, to be honest. The engineer squats over a green hollow globe, and that brings up a giant telescope-looking command seat that he hops right on up into. This is another pretty cool image to see, since again, this is where we originally saw an engineer back in the first movie. And he even puts his pachyderm helm on! Great! The ship boots up and causes a whole bunch of old faithfuls to erupt while the ground cracks open because guess what's about to take off? Oh, it's the juggernaut, bitch! Shaw radios the Prometheus and tells Yannick that the alien ship is about to head to Earth with that deadly goo. Yannick, if you don't stop it, 
It won't be your home to go back to. Yannick reluctantly tells his co-pilots, Ravel and Chance, to set a course for ramming speed. And although Vickers ain't about to go down like that, Yannick's bridge boys agree to stay with him to the end. The juggernaut takes off, and Prometheus chases after it. Yannick throws Vickers a bone by ejecting her separate module penthouse suite from the Prometheus, which has a bit of a crash landing on the surface, and then Vickers herself launches out of the ship in a personal escape pod, which thankfully has a bit of a smoother touchdown. Then the Prometheus kicks it into overdrive, and the boys put their hands up like they're riding their last roller coaster ever. The resulting crash gives us a wonderful giant fiery explosion that claims the lives of Captain Yannick and his two co-pilots. And yeah, maybe there were other crew members on the ship, but thanks to this movie's slapdash editing and storytelling, I don't know for sure. So I can only count those self-sacrificing bridge boys. The Juggernaut crashes to the ground for what is probably this movie's most maligned scene, one I was already familiar with before I ever even saw it. Cause after that croissant starts a rolling towards Shaw and Vickers, they run away from it in a completely straight line. Yep, just staying under that thing's shadow like it's the goal of some shitty Mario Party minigame. Why would you not turn 90 degrees and run to safety, you fools? After Vickers trips to the ground, Shaw finally gets the bright idea to roll her ass on out of there, but it's too late for Mr. Wayland's baby girl, who gets crushed to death by the runaway ship. At least Charlize Theron acted the hell out of this role up to the very end. The ship tips over, and although Shaw narrowly avoids being crushed, she's not out of the woods quite yet, as evidenced by the Subnautica warning her suit gives her. Warning, you have two minutes of oxygen remaining. She makes it over to Vickers' penthouse module, but after closing the door and stabilizing the atmosphere, she hears a nasty noise coming from the module's medical wing, cause turns out her C-section trilobite has been surviving and thriving this whole time. Things only get worse after David radios her, cause he's somehow still functioning, to tell her she's got a visitor coming. Knock knock, daddy's home. The giant engineer attacks her, but she hits a button and releases the Kraken. And the now very large trilobite pins the last engineer down as Shaw crawls away from the fight between her god daddy and her alien love child. She gets the heck out of that life pod right as the trilobite opens its mouth, or mouths, I don't know, and sticks a nice thick tentacle down the last engineer's throat. Great news for people with alien men slash octopus fetishes. Rule 34 continues to hold up. David radios Shaw again to tell her he can get them off the planet if she puts them back together, since there are other ships around and he knows how to play that alien jazz flute. She agrees to his plan as long as he'll fly them not back to Earth, but to the home planet of the engineers, so she can ask them why they were going to be such dicks and destroy all the life on Earth they had helped to create in the first place. The movie ends with another juggernaut successfully launching into space, as Shaw delivers a Ripley-like voice log so this movie can repeat one last thing from the original. Oh, Oh wait, then there's an extra scene where we see what happens after the trilobite infected the last engineer. The bald beauty's body gives birth to a, well, apparently it's called a deacon, which again, just kind of feels like they wanted a not xenomorph creature, even though this thing is very obviously a knockoff xenomorph. How many people died at the hands of zombies and not xenomorphs? Let's find out at the numbers. Fifteen people died in Prometheus, at least as far as we could see. The victims consisted of 13 men and only two women, and surprisingly for an alien movie, no androids. You lucked out there, Fastbender. With a runtime of 124 minutes, we had a kill on average every 8.27 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Fifefield, as long as I can count the helmet-melting transformation along with his much simpler mutant death. If you think I can't do that, well then here, it goes to Wallace, cause that death was brutal and kinda came out of nowhere. Dull machete for lamest kill will go to Vickers, because even though some other kills were pretty lame, none of them were as head-scratchingly stupid as this roll of death. And that's it! Prometheus came out in 2012, and its sequel, Alien Covenant, works as the second part of the Alien prequel trilogy. We'll look at that next week, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like True Killa, James Bayless, Kristen S. Hanley, and Thomas Jacobson. Y'all know I love the Alien series, so I was excited to finally watch Prometheus. I just wish it was a little bit better, man. And spoiler, Covenant, still not great. What'd you think of all those new creatures? They look cool, right? Thanks, everyone. Be good people.